Ever since I was a young boy, there are two things I was really interested in. Stories and my ethnic background. Like many of you in this room, my background is blended. Hawaii is my home, born and raised in these islands. But my dad's side is Japanese and my mom's Italian-Irish, or so I thought. You see, a couple years ago, I learned about the Genographic Project. It's an initiative that started in 2005 with the good folks of National Geographic. Over the ensuing decade, they've collected 700,000 and counting DNA samples from 144 countries with people that touch every region on Earth. Now, why does this matter? They are redrawing our map based not on geopolitical boundaries, but rather on the migration patterns of our ancestors as they left Africa starting from about 60,000 years ago. And within this DNA sample, They've collected a lot of indigenous people's DNA. And why does this matter? Because within these people's DNA lies the story of all of our entire homo sapiens species. And for someone of this interest, I had no choice. Of course I submitted my DNA. And this is what I got back. What you see up there are three numbers. They are consistent DNA markers with people who are in fact Japanese, Italian, and Irish. But if you totalize these numbers, you'll recognize that almost a full quarter of my DNA is not represented. This is why. 13% of me has markers that match distinct DNA of people who live in modern Vietnam and Northeast India. Along with that, another 9% from people who live in modern day Tajikistan and Iran. When I submitted my DNA, sure, I wanted to know a little bit more about where I came from. But what I got instead was an understanding of how much we actually all share. And that's what I'm going to talk to you folks about today. Three things in particular. Our eyes, our brain, and the way in which our bodies function. And importantly, how light needs to be re-engineered so that it actually matches our ancestry and our biology. So let's step back in time further, say 2.3 million years ago or so, you would have met what we now call Homo habilis. Now these folks had only one source of light, that which was in the sky, right, that yellow disk. Let us fast forward that evolutionary clock, approximately 1.1 million years, you would have met a more advanced species whom we now call Homo erectus. These fellows apparently could create and manipulate fire thereby creating for themselves two forms of light, one celestial, one terrestrial. Over the next ensuing one million years or so, you'll find that while our light sources did change and modify a little bit, essentially, we, Homo sapiens, and all those who came before us were beholden to the fiery sun and the naked flame. All of that changed on October 21st, 1879, 136 years ago, a certain group of homo sapiens, led by one Thomas Edison, changed our world dramatically and drastically. Never again would our light be engaged in the same way as a homo sapien, and our nights would never be dark again. As you look at these stars, native Hawaiians, Kanakamoli, have a special relationship with the darkness. As I understand, there are more words for black, dark, and night than there are for the opposite of light. These stars, this dark sky that you see in front of you, is the same set of stars that ancient Polynesians would have seen as they traversed the Pacific, up north, eventually settling in our islands that we call home today. If you were to liken the ocean to their highway, the stars and the dark sky would be their mental maps. Let's back up a little bit. This is actually a photo taken recently above Mauna Kea Observatory, which by many people's standards is the pristine place to observe our universe. Now I want you to focus your eyes on the bottom part of this picture. You see that nice, wonderful orange glow? I would forgive you if you thought that this was a sunset. A sunset, it is not. It is this, Honolulu City Lights at Night. Now we, Homo sapiens, we're a very optimistic and extremely adaptive people. But with the advance of electric light, we have changed literally in about five generations our entire ancestry. We, like many other species, evolved in our environment. But what we've done with the electric light and the way that light now invades our dark nights, 
We have separated ourselves progressively over the decades and pulled ourselves away from our natural 24-hour dark light cycles. So now you understand this is what is happening all around us the past 140 years or so. Now I want to take you inside of us. Our eyes, just like our ears, essentially have two functions. Many of you already know that our ears function to help us hear, but also to help us balance. Likewise, our eyes help us see our world, but they also help us control our body. This is called visual sensitivity and this, biological sensitivity. You see this woman's eyes? You see what's inside there? All of us, if you recall, learned this when we were in elementary school. Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. It is this Biv, this blue light, that now in our night has changed everything. You know, for well over 400 years, at least two poets have said that our eyes are the windows into our soul. What I'd like to show you is how, in fact, our eyes touch our very core. So this is what happens. Light enters your eye. A certain part of our ancient eye, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell, the IPRGCs, send a message to a part of our brain that's about this small. This amazingly small, yet amazingly powerful part of our brain controls our entire circadian rhythms. The messages flow throughout our body, come back up, right above our cerebellum, to a place called the pineal gland. Melatonin production and secretion into our body is the main function of this gland. It's interesting. This gland is inhibited by light and is powered by darkness. Now, something important to remember is that as early as 1975, we already knew Research has already done saying that second only to food and water, light is the most important environmental input that changes our bodily functions. So what is a circadian rhythm? Circa is Latin for approximately. Dias or diem is that of a day. Circadian rhythm is a biological built-in process that oscillates about once every 24 hours. It's witnessed and been observed by many in us, animals, but as well as in the plant kingdom and even bacteria. What's important to note is that this can be adjusted by environmental cues. And one of the most common and powerful is light. So what does an average healthy circadian rhythm look like in an adult? And keep in mind, healthy is a key point here. Let's cut this cup in half from the 6 to the 18. Everything above it is essentially day, everything below it essentially night. This is a 24 hour clock around this coffee cup, right? Let's start in the darkness. 9 p.m., approximately when your melatonin starts to be flowing in your body. Around 2 a.m., this is when you're really getting your deepest sleep. As the sun rises, your melatonin drops and your cortisol increases. Thereafter, you have your highest alertness. The sun comes to its peak during the midday. And with it, shortly thereafter, is your best, your greatest, and your fastest capabilities. If we step back, we look at this and generalize, one could make the argument that we plan in the morning, we hunt in the afternoon, and we rest and do other things at night. I had an opportunity to talk to a particular professor at Harvard. His name is Dr. Stephen Lockley. He's a neurologist or neuroscientist that specializes in circadian and sleep disorders. What he basically shared was shocking to me. All of those, he basically told me, that live in the industrialized nations, all of us here and everyone essentially watching, are in perpetual jet lag. Now, why does this matter? You don't need to be able to read Ukrainian to see what this sign says. 1986, Chernobyl, the worst and first level seven nuclear incident that we experienced. This is what it looks like when up to 38 million gallons of petroleum get spilled into the Prince William Sound off of Alaska. Now this next one, this is personal. This is Space Shuttle Challenger. I remember this day clearly, January 28th, 1986. It was a day after my 11th birthday. But more important than that, my classmate Lauren, her uncle was Ellison Onizuka. We watched, all of us, all of you probably, watched as seconds after the launch, space shuttle no longer existed. It exploded, killing all seven astronauts. And with it, 
those of us who had dreams of going to space camp or maybe even becoming one day an astronaut to follow in the footsteps of Uncle Ellison, all of that, gone. Land, sea, air, what is the one thing that connects these catastrophes? All of their official investigative reports said sleep deprivation was a cause. Now, it doesn't have to be this level of a disaster. Every single day, we are impacted by this lack of sleep and the light infringing upon our night. 100,000 car crashes happen in this country alone because of tiredness. $100 billion is estimated by the National Science, uh, Sleep Foundation that we lose through productivity, medical bills, environmental, and property damage. In 2007, the World Health Organization declared that shift work was a probable carcinogen. Now, who doesn't know somebody that does shift work? Our police officers, our firemen. We live in a society that is largely funded by our tourism sector. Everyone that works a shift in a hotel, people that work in a 24-7 Safeways, right? Everyone is touched by someone who does shift work. It's a probable carcinogen. Now, it's not just our society. It is not just our technology. It's not just our light that in, gets into our dark nights. It is also us. It's our attitudes and our acceptable societal norms that have changed in a mere five generations. To give you a quote to ponder upon, coming from our own American, sleep is a criminal waste of time, a heritage from our cave days. Do you know who said this or reportedly said this? was Thomas Edison. Does it make you think twice as why this gentleman may have created electric light? Let's skip across the pond now to the UK. Former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher supposedly said, sleep is for wimps. Now, what could the Iron Lady have done if her circadian rhythms were actually on track? And she actually got sleep. Many people may not know, she was an insomniac. Got maybe four hours of sleep a night. Right? Make no mistake, folks, this is an epidemic. But, like everything in life, we need balance. One thing to keep in mind is that if we use light properly, it actually has the power to give us great benefits physiologically, emotionally, and intellectually. The great Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. If light is the problem, then light fundamentally is a part of the solution. Yes, we need dark nights, but what we also need are bright days. Bright days can build this. We exist. Homo habilis, homo erectus, they're in our fossil record. Their adults probably could not build something like this. Our children build this at the beach. Our children, as we stand here today across the street, we have a robotics competition happening. Our children are tackling fantastically difficult competitions that are much significantly difficult than this. Now, it's been shown through studies that bright light during the day, both natural as well as electric, has the ability to increase our speed, our accuracy, our ability to learn productivity in the office, our mood even, and importantly, sleep. Now, the folks who've been bringing you these bright lights over the past 140 years, even the lighting industry recognizes this, and they're making moves right now through technology to create light technologies that actually work with our biorhythms. They're calling it human-centric lighting. There's technologies that you folks can buy. You can download free apps. Right? You can get glasses, that, you can get filters for your screens. All of these things at night will block out the blue light. We can make change. Parents, we control our and our children's light that they see after the sun sets. Schools and employers of organizations both for-profit and non-profit, you have choices. You can install better light. You can respect our circadian rhythms as they change throughout our life. You can start school later. You can start work later. Academia and government, we've done this before. Obesity, smoking, alcoholism, drug addiction. We funded something when it was an epidemic and we attacked it with what we needed to do. 
This is one that we should also do. You, me, all of us, we have the power to change. 40 years ago and 20 days, March 8th, 1975, Hoku Lea left Oahu and successfully began his journey to Tahiti. Many believed that this was not possible, that modern Hawaiians, they couldn't do what their ancient ancestors did. Nainoa Thompson and all of those over the past 40 years who have been a part of the Polynesian Voyaging Society have proved them wrong time and time again. Native Hawaiians were able to purposefully, intentionally navigate across the largest and most dangerous ocean in the world without mechanical navigation instrumentation. This that you see in front of you, this is a view that they saw many a day. Now I want to stop for just a second. I want you to contemplate what you see in front of you. What do you see here? Is it joyous opportunity to reconnect with your historical and your heritage from the past? Essentially, closing the loop? Or do you see this as hopeless desolation? There's no land. There's no cloud even, not even a bird. Likely, no potable water. Perspective is everything. The knowledge that we have, our understanding of circumstances, our ability to choose to take action, this impacts our community and then by definition impacts our world. If Hokulea can do this, we can all do this. And so, I want you folks to be empowered to be able to capture back that which was in a way taken from us. I want you to be able to ensure that you have better tonight so that you can have better tomorrows. I'd like to lay out a challenge to you folks. But before I do that, before you folks came in here, you were essentially pre-selected. The seat that you chose may or may not have something underneath it. What I'd like you to do is go ahead and reach under your chairs and see what you have. So while you folks do that, let me just share, no matter how much power we have currently as we stand right now, one in three of us, before we die, will have a sleep disorder. I want you folks to change this for our community. Make it one in four, one in five, or even more. So what you have is what I have. I'm not asking of you to do anything that I'm not willing to step up and do first. I want you to do three things in this blue light challenge. First, I want you to wear then share, and then spread. Wear these glasses, and trust me, they look a lot cooler after three days. <laughs> I want you to wear them for at least three consecutive nights, from the point when the sun sets all the way until you go to sleep. Then, I want you to share what you've learned today about circadian rhythms, the importance of light and dark balance, with family and friends over the next ensuing week. And lastly, I want you to be able to spread the word. Use social media. Ted X Honolulu Facebook page, I would love for you, we would love for you to post on it. Share your stories, your anecdotes, your experiences. Make it so that this 24-hour cycle and all the amazing speakers you heard today, the paradigm shift that you've experienced, make it last longer than just today. Make it happen again and again. And with that, folks, I'd like you to remember one important thing. With great light comes great responsibility. Thank you.